of the Atlantic Council. Um, it's a great pleasure to invite you all to this uh, important conference on NATO's deterrence and collective defense. But let me put it in a little bit of historic context. The Atlantic Council was born, if you look at our official charter in 1961, when several Atlantic clubs and groups came together at the request of Secretary of State Dean Rusk, then in the Kennedy administration as Secretary of State, he brought together Dean Acheson, Henry Cabot Lodge, Lucius Clay, Mary Lord, and others, and said, the historic moment is just too important. I need you all working together. It's 1961. We're facing a potential crisis in Berlin and elsewhere in the world, and, uh, and I need you to come together. Uh, but the real birth of the Atlantic Council was really in 1949, just after the birth of NATO, when these clubs first came into, uh, into existence. And it's worth remembering here today that Norway uh, was one of the founding members of NATO when that treaty was signed on the 4th of April of 1949. I say that all because we're at another historic inflection point. Uh, the Atlantic Council uh, is of the opinion that this inflection point uh, is as important as many that we've seen in the last century. Uh, 1919, 1945, 1989, we're facing the biggest shift of political and economic influence of power since the 19th century, in rough terms from west to east and from north to south. But the real question is as this shift takes place, how are we going to set the rules? How are we going to make sure the values that we stand for, democracy, rule of law, uh, in individual rights, uh, are protected? Uh, so this is a conference about NATO, but it's really a conference about much more than that. It really is a conference about, and it's called NATO in an era of glo global competition, but it's about the West, it's about the alliance in a new era. Uh, this is also part of an 18-month effort which has been organized together with the Norwegian Institute for Defense Studies and has been generously supported by the Ministry of Defense of Norway. Uh, the project was launched earlier this year with a clear purpose to address the role of NATO and the broader transatlantic community in the face of emerging security challenges, global power shifts, which I just talked about, and new disruptive technologies. We have a storm of change coming at us and we're not moving fast enough to address it. That's our, our, that's our view as we go toward a NATO summit uh, in the fall and September of 2014 which is accompanied by an effort to create a transatlantic trade and investment partnership uh, across the Atlantic, which would be the biggest trade and investment agreement in history, uh, a sort of economic NATO, if you will. Uh, this first the first conference of this effort with Norway, NATO in a new security landscape, took place in June. And as many of you remember, it not only identified key challenges and threats NATO is likely to face, but also sent out a message of tough love, that unless NATO does, does, uh, unless NATO does adapt with foresight for this new era of global competition, it risks disintegration, disengagement, and shrinking relevance in global affairs, and there is nothing to replace it. We had no idea when we started this process what would happen thereafter. Since June, the dynamics in transatlantic affairs have changed dramatically. The escalation of the Syrian conflict, the work to eradicate chemical weapons from Syria uh, has put the uh, Atlantic Alliance to test in how we work with each other in this sort of new situation. What should the engagement of the West be in this kind of humanitarian geopolitical crisis that is already causing massive instability in the region and beyond? At the same time, just as we thought we'd survived the summer of Snowden, the latest revelations regarding the NSA shot the transatlantic partnership straight into the heart of trust uh, among the countries. As we take this on, we have to realize it isn't just about this issue, but it's really to restore trust ahead of the negotiations of the Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership and ahead of a NATO summit next year, where we could actually end this whole process with a much stronger alliance and U.S.-European relationship. 
As the Alliance heads towards its 2014 summit and continues to be troubled by the uncertain future in Afghanistan, declining defense budgets, and lack of a coherent approach vis-a-vis -vis its partners across the globe, including Russia and countries aspiring for NATO membership. It's against that backdrop that we're gathered here today to help shape transatlantic responses to these challenges and to divine, define new cutting edge deterrence concepts in light of not only new threats and challenges, but also in the light of the new dynamics of this transatlantic relationship. We have to think new because the world is changing and if we continue to think in old categories, we won't succeed. It's no accident that we're looking at these issues with our friends and colleagues from Norway who have repeatedly been at the cutting edge of NATO thinking, have repeatedly been leaders in the alliance. Thinking about its future and, uh, and thinking about how one can work more effectively across the Atlantic. So first off, I want to thank our partner, partners in the Norwegian Ministry of Defense, uh, Policy Director Svein Afjestad, Director for Transatlantic and European Security, Arald Eikeland, and Senior Advisor Christine Fjellstad. I would also like to acknowledge our partners at the Norwegian Institute for Defense Studies, senior fellow Michael Mayers and his colleagues at the IFS who are with us today. Uh, and last but not least, I would like to thank our colleagues here in Washington. And Ambassador Kore As, uh, who is fairly new uh, to Washington, uh, but we're already working very closely with him and his team and we're extremely proud uh, for what we've been able to build together. Uh, Defense Attaché Rear Admiral Tron Gritting and Defense Counselor Harald Storen, we're working very closely with them. And I'm, I'm very glad to see an old Atlantic Council friend, Keith Eikenes, here today as well, uh, where we did a lot of the work together with him when he was at the embassy, and he's now uh, advising on transatlantic issues at the MOD uh, back in Norway. So thank you all for this fantastic cooperation. Um, before I turn to our distinguished guests, I would also like to point out that the project is part of our broader campaign in the run-up to the 2014 NATO Summit and relates to our core programming on the future of the transatlantic community. Uh, in the past weeks, we've hosted multiple transatlantic leaders, including ministers of defense of Romania, Denmark, Latvia, and Spain, and most recently, the delegation of 10 permanent representatives to NATO led by Ambassador Doug Lute of the United States. Uh, we had German colleagues in town last week as part of the Munich Security Conference delegation. Uh, Ambassador Ischinger's team and, uh, uh, and Brookings organized together with us a key core group meeting of the Munich Security Conference ahead of their 2014 meeting. And we then used uh, Ambassador Ischinger's presence here and featured him together with General Michael Hayden uh, at, at an important conference call on the NSI, NSA spying uh, scandal. Last but not least, uh, tomorrow we have another important speaker lined up on this set of issues. Ambassador Victoria Newland, Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs, will deliver her first public speech in her new capacity, revolving around a new strategy for a broader transatlantic relationship, putting together many of these pieces I've been talking about. So you're all cordially invited to join us tomorrow at 4.30 p.m. in this same place. Uh, this line of programming and today's effort are supported by the Brent Scowcroft Center and its Transatlantic Security Initiative. And for that, I want to thank uh, Atlantic Council Vice President and Director of the Scowcroft Center, Barry Pavel, veteran of the Pentagon and the White House, for his thoughtful leadership and the great work of his team and uh, for putting together this uh, terrific lineup today. Uh, the opening panel will address new challenges and tools of deterrence and how NATO should reposition its deterrence strategy to be able to face the challenges of cyber, energy, and economic coercion. After the first panel, Ambassador Evo Dalder, uh, the former permanent representative of the United States to NATO, has, will come in from Chicago. He's currently president of the Chicago Council of Global Affairs to deliver his first major speech in Washington since he left his post in Brussels. And you know ambassadors can talk a little bit more freely when they leave their uh, positions uh, as ambassador. 
So we're looking forward to that. And in the afternoon, we'll look at NATO's traditional deterrence components, including missile defense, nuclear and conventional posture, and we'll evaluate how effective it is uh, to meet the future challenges and if and how NATO's deterrence posture needs to be restructured and redefined. So we'll look at the macro part of this and we'll also look at the micro part of this. Without further ado, I'd like to turn the floor uh, to the panelists of the first panel, which will be moderated by our Executive Vice President, Damon Wilson. Damon. <clears throat> Thank you very much for kicking us off. I'm Damon Wilson, Executive Vice President here at the Council. Let me just echo Fred Kemp's uh, welcoming uh, to all of you in our audience, as well as to Ambassador Kara Ass and the, our team, our partners from Norway. This is a conference on NATO's deterrence and collective defense. And this discussion, this session, this first panel discussion is on the new challenges and new tools around deterrence. Um, as Fred said, this conference today is part of a much larger project that we've called NATO in an era of global competition. And it really is an, a chance for the Atlantic Council in the run up to the NATO summit in 2014 to think long term about where the alliance is going. Um, in essence, it's a project to help sharpen the purpose and relevance uh, of, as the alliance as we head into what Fred characterized as an inflection point in history. For all of you in our audience, um, we're keen on ensuring that this summit next year it's not just the last summit on Afghanistan, essentially, the last Afghanistan summit, but it really is a summit that kicks off a new chapter of NATO's future, a healthy future for the alliance. Um, for all of you, everyone knows that during the Cold War, the alliance was about deterring deterrence. It was about deterring the Soviet threat. Um, in post-89, the alliance was known for outreach to the East, helping to transform former adversaries into allies, opening up the historic process of enlargement. With the dissolution of the former Yugoslavia, the alliance became very active in its first operational role and became an, institute, uh, an institution of first resort for crisis management. Um, and post 9-11, we saw an alliance that continued to transform, really to tackle challenges, to tackle threats regardless of where they may originate in terms of geography, whether that was the Taliban and the Hindu Kush, uh, whether it was missiles originating from uh, facilities in, in Iran. Uh, or whether it was from unknown hackers in cyberspace, we saw an alliance beginning to think differently about its approach to security. And the question facing us today is now what? What's next? The Washington Treaty, which set up the, the NATO alliance, it doesn't identify an enemy. At the end of the day, the, the alliance is about binding the security of North American Europe together. Um, for all contingencies. Um, it's actually about deterrence rather than any particular enemy. So what does that mean in today's world um, when we have non-state actors, new actors, global power shifts, disruptive technology, asymmetric threats? <clears throat> NATO's just concluded, I think on November 8th, NATO concluded uh, a major exercise, a multinational exercise involving 6,000 troops uh, from 28 nations uh, called Exercise Steadfast Jazz. Um, this was one of the most important exercises the Alliance has done in recent years, but it raises the question of what type of exercise, what type of deterrence is this Alliance preparing for, for the future? To get us into this conversation, we've got four terrific panelists discussants. Um, Barry Pavel, to our, my far left, is the Vice President and Director of the Brent Scowcroft Center. Barry will update you on the work that we've done to date as part of this project and laying out a new concept for the deterrence and the Alliance. He joined the Atlantic Council after a long career in the Pentagon and also having served as a Special Assistant to the President, Senior Director for Defense Policy and Strategy at the White House, uh, and played a heavy role in strategy issues at the Pentagon. Um, to his left is uh, Stefano Stefanini. Uh, he is the newest uh, Atlantic Council Senior Fellow in the Scowcroft Center. Welcome, it's a delight to have you with us today. Uh, he also holds positions with the Podesta Group and is Vice President of Otomalara and the Femmechanica Group. 
but he's on this panel discussion today because he served uh, not only as, uh, as diplomatic advisor to, the, to President Napolitano of Italy, but as Italy's uh, permanent representative to NATO. He also has had serv diplomatic service in Washington, uh, Moscow, and the United Nations. Uh, to his right, Svein uh, Effiestad, uh, the policy director for the Norwegian Ministry of Defense. He served as director general or, or security policy director uh, for the Norwegian Ministry of Defense since 1995. And in that capacity, really became known as the father of NATO security policy directors. It's a delight to have you with us. He also served at NATO headquarters and has been uh, one of the intellectual uh, architects of this project that we're working on. Uh, and finally, next to me, uh, Jason Healy, the director of our Cyber Statecraft Initiative here at the Atlantic Council, who will speak about deterrence uh, in the cyber realm. Uh, he served as a, as a policy director at the White House, as, as executive director uh, at Goldman Sachs Asia, and as a U.S. Air Force intelligence officer, bringing all of those attributes together in his work together on cyberspace, recently published A Fierce Domain, a terrific first history of uh, conflict in cyberspace. Uh, so with that, Barry, let me come back to you and turn to you to kick off uh, this discussion. Given the world that Fred laid out as this inflection point, given the new challenges the Alliance is facing, what is the relevant meaning of deterrence today as we look to the future? Thank you, Damon, and uh, thanks for the really easy questions that you've posed to me. Um, but you know, seriously, thank you to our Norwegian partners who've been wonderful to work with, and it's just a, a real pleasure to, um, to be addressing these critical issues uh, at this critical time. I thought Fred Kemp did a fantastic job of sort of summarizing, not just because he's my boss, uh, but of sort of summarizing the essence of our June 5th conference, which started this this effort, sort of where the world's headed in the medium and long term, these major changes that are underway, and sort of our job is how do we help posture NATO to be as ready as possible for the surprises that will come, for the contingencies that may be likely, and for sort of deterrence approaches that are reasonable and effective in light of the budget constraints that, that we all face. And so I think the types of issues he addressed, in particular, I think one that I would just add is this rise of individual power, individual empowerment undergirded by the rise of a global middle class, largely focused in Asia, but also by disruptive technologies that are giving individuals and groups, I think for the, really for the first time in, in history, the ability to take strategically significant action you know, in a major way with biotech, with 3D printing, with other technologies technologies, I think it's clear we're going to have to spend more time in the future as planners looking at the individual level of challenges and opportunities, as well as at the state level, which we're much more comfortable dealing with, which our institutions, um, including NATO, are much more comfortable dealing with. So I'll start uh, my suggestions for new deterrence approaches with sort of two contradictory principles. Um, one is, I think, for deterrence, the first question is always, for me, deter whom from doing what? And I think it matters a lot, you know, what deters one leader from taking a specific type of action may be different because they uh, act in a different context than what deters another leader from taking a different type of action. But the second principle is we are just terrible at predicting future threats and contingencies. I mean, time and again, we get surprised. Uh, we can go through the long list. I'm sure most of you know it. So the problem is it's really hard to specify with, with precision you know, what military contingency will be the next big one. I'm sure in December of 2010, if someone had said NATO would be operating an air campaign over North Africa, they would have been you know, sent to an asylum. Uh, but that's indeed what happened in the following year, as you know, over Libya. So um, with those two principles in mind, even though they create some complications, I think it's really important to think after 2014, what, are, what could NATO's priority missions be? And there's a lot of things NATO does, but what should really be the focus areas? And I, I'm going to pose three as um, suggestive and would love to hear from you in the discussions about whether these three are about, about right. And in no particular order, I think first, uh, NATO's going to have to engage in some form or fashion in what I call the greater Middle East. This is an area that's going to be unstable for generations to come. And I don't think uh, we can have the entire underside of Eurasia in turmoil, really, and expect it not to, de to demand the attention of the world's foremost alliance, which is right next door. So I think this will be a priority, perhaps the top priority, really whether we wish it to be 
or not. Pivoting to Asia would be wonderful, but I don't think the, the Middle East is going to accommodate. So I think there are potential roles, which I'll get into in a little bit, on, on a steady state basis for NATO or NATO members, and certainly also in crises, which I think unfortunately will demand NATO's attention. Second, I think Russia looms at, at least as importantly, uh, and I think here NATO has to think about a hedge against Russian futures. And the Russian future that I worry most about is a declining Russia. And this is in part due to the shale gas revolution, which is dropping the price of energy, which I think in essence is going to bankrupt Russia's state, state business model. And then there's also some very daunting demographic factors that are going to, I think, really create some new, new challenges uh, for Russia. And I worry about a Russian leader trying to distract a very restive and unhappy domestic population by launching some sort of coercion or aggression um, in the area. So that's the sort of the Russia that I worry about. And there's things that can be deterred in those scenarios. And then third, I think, perhaps the third NATO mission is preparing for the unexpected. This one's tough. Uh, this is the one that's most likely, as we've proven. And so I think what this means is we need to take a portfolio approach. Now I'll go through each of these sort of in turn in terms of the specific deterrence um, issues that I think are, are important. For the Middle East, I think it's a bit problematic for the alliance to highlight this you know, clearly and explicitly due to political constraints for, on NATO planning for contingencies in the Middle East. But we know that threats from this region can directly affect some NATO member nations, such as Turkey. And we know that potentially broader challenges loom despite uh, President Rouhani's magnificent charm offensive. And I do think it's an important uh, opportunity uh, for our negotiations with Iran. Those negotiations ultimately may not bear fruit as happened with North Korea in the 1990s. North Korea now has roughly a dozen nuclear weapons and we cannot rule that out, uh, although it would be a really uh, very, very challenging uh, and consequential future. We cannot rule that out. If that happens, we've heard Saudi Arabia may acquire nuclear weapons. This is a major disequilibrium right next door to the alliance that, that the NATO, uh, that NATO members would have to be attentive to, even though it's really difficult to deal with. Uh, we also can't rule out an unstable Pakistan, which would have very significant implications for NATO in particular because of WMD armed elements getting a hold of these dangerous weapons and using them in ways that would be very dangerous for us. So that's just a couple of thoughts on the Middle East. In terms of Russia, I think we also have some constraints on our deterrence. Um, and certainly the Russian challenge is felt much more by northern members of NATO than by other members of the alliance, including the United States government, which I would s state rather clearly places Russia as a defense problem in a pretty low, uh, at a pretty low level of priority. I think we just need to state that uh, clearly. And I think Russian challenges may come in more sophisticated forms than we saw during the Cold War. Uh, we're talking more about energy coercion, about cyber, which we'll hear about, about covert operations, about Arctic contingencies, which I think are newly important for obvious reasons, about softer things like Russia funding pro-Russian mayoral campaigns in the Baltic nations. And so I think these are questions we should parse through. Where are their roles for NATO? Um, these are serious challenges. NATO is going to have to get more nuanced, I think, to deal with those types of, um, of, of security issues. And then in terms of sort of preparing for the unexpected, there are other obvious difficulties in this area. But here we take a portfolio approach. Asia looms very large, as Fred Kemp said. This is where economic power is shifting and defense budgets across Asia are rising very rapidly. And we can talk about some of the statistics. But there's also challenges associated with non-state actors. As I said, individuals and groups, and I worry in particular about bioterrorism these days with a very significant expansion of the proliferation of centers of biological expertise. Uh, unfortunately, I think it's much more likely that we'll see bioterrorism and I think NATO publics could be better informed and made more resilient to these types of threats. And so there are, essence, there are, there are elements of a deterrence and assurance approaches, even in dealing with non-state actors, which we could talk about more. And then even in Asia, I think there are NATO members that have uh, territory in, in, on the Pacific Ocean, 
For instance, if a North Korean ICBM hits Guam, that's an Article 5 Pacific contingency. We should talk about sort of what that means for NATO and for NATO planning and NATO responses, but I don't think there's any uh, getting around that uh, essential fact. Now, in terms of the tools that we have, because I wanted to address tools before I pass to my other panelists, I think there's sort of three categories of those types of tools that we can use to underwrite the deterrence approaches that I just talked about. The first category is traditional areas. We'll hear about some of them later today, as the DDPR also discussed, and I think you all know that list pretty well. There's also some emerging areas, and I would put cyber and space still in the emerging areas. Um, let me focus on space because we'll hear about cyber, but I, I think space is an area that NATO's sorely behind in. Russia's doctrine calls for taking out NATO's access to critical space assets in the early days or even hours of any sort of conflict or contingency. And NATO's approach is, well, I'm not sure if anyone here knows what NATO's approach is, but it seems to not really address it for a couple of reasons that some of, some of us know. So I think it's really important in terms of all of the areas where we should be erecting deterrence efforts uh, and where there is demand and challenges that might be associated with these domains, space may be the one where supply just doesn't come close to demand. And I think it's important to note that weaknesses in space deterrence can undermine general deterrence because NATO and the US in particular are the most reliant on space assets for our military operations. There was some good stuff in a RAND study in terms of how to address space deterrence. Just very quickly, international norms, enhancing collective space security capabilities, enhancing the resilience of space architecture, which involves sort of redundancy and potentially using some new technologies such as CubeSats, where we don't have these very expensive satellites that have everything in them. We can put up a constellation and more of a network approach. And then I also think we need to have a deterrence policy, a declaratory policy for space that people actually understand and that adversaries and allies alike understand that includes concepts of proportionate escalation that are not just limited to space. Um, and then thirdly, new areas that I think are worth considering as the world is changing so quickly for deterrence tools. One is energy. I mean, it's possible we'll see a crisis in the future in the Pacific, maybe in uh, the European area, where there's some sort of blockade or there's some sort of energy coercion. And with the new shale gas revolution, with other new energy developments uh, going on, I think it's possible we could use energy supply as a tool for reassurance and potentially also deterrence. And then secondly, Juan Zarate has a new book out called Treasury's War, which looks at financial instruments. How do those play a role in compellence? in deterrence. I think they can be better integrated into NATO's deterrence um, approach. And so at the Atlantic Council here, we're looking at a lot of these tools and trying to look at how to better integrate them in terms of deterrence in Asia and in this conversation, deterrence in Europe. Let me just end by saying I think everything I've just said sort of has four implications for the portfolio approach we need to take to NATO's deterrent. Number one, I think NATO has to really greatly differentiate its partnerships in the Middle East and in Asia for the reasons that are quite obvious in terms of what's going on in the world. Number two, I think the alliance's technology advantage is in danger of being lost. I mean, there are so many pacing competitive um, activities underway in China, in Russia, among individuals, in niche areas. I think it takes a much more concerted, focused effort for the alliance to retain its technology advantages in key areas. Third, I think strategic foresight should be practiced at NATO, and that is looking more at these longer term trends, but coming back to the present and saying, what do all these things mean for our current planning, for our uh, contingency planning, for our strategic concept, for our capabilities, discussions, et cetera. I think this is an, a new but important element to be added. And then lastly, and I think many of you in this audience can help us, I think a lot of non-state actors, private sector actors, need to be brought more into NATO's efforts, be they energy companies, be they financial companies, uh, technological companies. Because if we're really moving to a, a world that I call Westphalian plus, it's not just state actors but non-state, then I think we really need to much more strongly leverage the assets, uh, knowledge, and capabilities that such companies can bring to NATO's deterrence approach. So if I had to summarize everything I just said, 
um, I would sort of basically call it the, the cross approach, which is for NATO's deterrent, I think it needs to be cross domain, I think it needs to be cross regional, and I think it needs to be cross actor. Thanks very much. Terrific. Thank you very much, Barry, for taking the time to lay out that concept. I want to um, <clears throat> pivot from the American perspective and come to Stein first before picking up uh, Jay and uh, Stefano. Um, Barry's just laid out this concept of an alliance thinking about an engagement and prepared for the greater Middle East, which I hope you'll get into as well. Um, hedging against Russia, preparing for the unexpected. He's talking about bioterrorism, space, energy, these new tools. And yet in our conversations uh, in our last uh, uh, event, there was a sense among some of our European uh, participants weary of a decade plus of battle in Afghanistan, leery of future commitments, and where you saw commitments as in Libya, an effort to try to minimize the engagement of the alliance. Um, so I want to turn to you, Svein, this impetus among some that we hear in our European colleagues of hunker down, back to core Article 5, there's a crisis in, in capabilities because there's a crisis in defense spending. How do you reconcile what Barry has just laid out with how you as a European defense planner think about where the alliance is going, where it needs to go in terms of deterrence. Please, over to you. Thank you very much, Damon. Um, and thank you very much for the Atlantic Council for its uh, tireless effort to keep this transatlantic dialogue going and, and um, interesting people in the US. So it's very impressive to have all these high-ranking Americans present uh, to discuss these issues today. Um, what? Um, Barry Pavel said about preparing for the unexpected. Sorry. I don't have to repeat that, I suppose. <laughs> no, I think you're fine. <laughs> um, what Barry uh, said about preparing for the unexpected is very much what I will talk about. And as you said, Damon, also, it is to some extent returning to the basics. But um, I think this is a very timely initiative because your ISAF operation is coming to an end and we are preparing for the summit next fall. In my intervention today, I will focus on what I believe is necessary in order to implement the strategic concept from 2010. NATO, we and NATO have been quite good in creating new slogans, in creating new programs, but we have failed to a large extent to implement it, in my view. And I think those who know NATO really well, and I see there are some here, know that the, the state of the structures in NATO is not always what we want it to be. And I believe, therefore, that correcting some of these things is absolutely the best thing we can do in order to prepare for the unexpected. I'll try to be a little bit more concrete. Um, as we approach the next summit, um, we need to make sure that NATO remains relevant, as you said, and effective. Next year, we have an opportunity because we are going to update the political guidance. It used to be called ministerial guidance. And that is the document in which you set the, the real priorities and the programs for what we do need to do with NATO's defense capabilities and defense structures. And that as a, uh, is the most important document in addition to the strategic concept. I think we need to take a hard look at that one. And I will suggest, in order to be brief, only six points that I, I think we should look at there. One, we should, need, we should um, change our level of ambition. Today, the level of ambition is that we should be able to conduct two major and six small operations at the same time. We've had that ambition for a long time, and since, since we started with that ambition, our resources have decreased tremendously. And we are in a totally different situation today. In my view, we should change that level of ambition dramatically. And I would not change it by saying one plus two or something, but rather describe it in a totally different way. For example, saying that we need to be able to deter and defend the territories of the member countries, and we need to be able to deploy military capability to do crisis management at, at a certain distance. We need to be able to hedge against cyber attacks, space attacks, perhaps 
but we should take a totally new, new look, in my view, at the level of ambition. Secondly, I believe we need to incorporate cyber operations in NATO's planning. We talk about cyber, but it is, to me at least, almost inconceivable that there will be a future military conflict in which cyber doesn't play a, a prominent role. And I don't think we have really incorporated that into the planning mechanism in NATO. My third point is I think we should establish a general framework for contingency planning in NATO so that national defense plans can be attached to and linked to the wider NATO operational planning. I'm sorry to say that there is no common policy for, for contingency or operational planning in NATO today. We had during the Cold War. After that, we had some aspects of contingency planning, but we don't have a, a general policy covering it. And as we do our national planning in Norway, we really do need something to attach it to. One of the unique features of NATO is its command structure. And we all believe, at least the small countries in NATO, believe that in case of a serious crisis, we would ask NATO to take the lead and take the command of operations. We have seen time and again that the NATO command structure, as it is today, is not fully capable and ready to take on such tasks. Uh, one of many examples is the conflict in Libya. We had to send big reinforcements to the Air Command in Italy in order to take on that task, to do the targeting business. Um, and I think we cannot afford to have such a big command structure as we had, say, 20 years ago. So I think the best way to fix this is to create a pool of qualified personnel in the member states so that they can be deployed and support different operational commands if a conflict is rising. This is a cheap, I think, way to, to reinforce NATO's credibility um, in the command structure. One thing which is also relevant in this regard is to establish an education and certification program for officers in NATO jobs. We are now 28 nations uh, with very different um, structures and backgrounds and I think the Allied Command transformation could do a very, very useful job, job in training and qualifying officers, and for that matter, civilians, uh, to take on NATO jobs. My last point is that I think we should establish a policy for training and exercises to ensure interoperability and ability to participate in joint and combined operations. And this policy should cover all elements of our force structure. NATO has focused on very narrow force categories, like the NRF, for example. But that is only a very, very small proportion of NATO's uh, structures. So if we could create a common policy for training and exercises to do that job, I think that would uh, greatly increase cohesion in the military system in NATO its defense capability and thereby also deterrence. NATO's strategic concept entails three core tasks, collective defense, crisis management, and cooperative security, which basically is partnerships. And I, I firmly believe that collective defense is the basis for the alliance, as described in the Atlantic Treaty. And our credibility in relation to collective defense is basic for public support, in many countries, and also for NATO's relevance and ability to take on tasks such as crisis management and cooperative security. In other words, it is not possible to do the other two if you don't do the, the first task right. That's my point. But I think also uh, when we talk about collective defense, it is very important, as I said, to incorporate new aspects of this, like cyber, but also missile defense, and space, uh, a policy for space. So I, it, is, it needs to be updated in relation to the technological development. 
There's a lot of critical shortfalls in NATO, of course, joint reconnaissance, intelligence, special forces, uh, air refueling, and so on and so forth. But still, I believe that what really makes NATO attractive, credible and unique, uh, is that it has a permanent decision-making machinery, it has a permanent command structure, there's a common force planning and a common operational planning. This, under, uh, this builds the credibility, uh, the cohesion of, of the alliance and deterrence. One often says that NATO is changing from deployed to prepared. And uh, Barry, you posed the question, prepared for what? In my view, we must be prepared for collective defense and for international crisis management, both of them. And I, I fully agree with you, what you said about the Middle East. We need, therefore, also to have a situational awareness which has been lacking to a large extent in NATO. One of our initiatives pointed directly at the situational awareness. And as the Norwegian Air Force was planning to participate in Libya, we have to admit we didn't know very much about Libya or the surrounding areas. Uh, later, we got uh, quite a bit of information from Italy and France. But NATO, as such, had also very little knowledge. And definitely, NATO needs to have a situational awareness for the Mediterranean, for the Middle East, so that it can make recommendations to the political level if NATO can use its forces and policies um, in a relevant way to, to, to solve crisis in that region. Mm -hmm. And the same goes for Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. I think I'll stop there because I think I've used my time. Terrific. Fine. Let me ask you just one quick follow-up because you put an idea on the table to, to dramatically change the level of ambition for the alliance. And for many out there, this may sound like a technical issue, but it's an, in, it's an incredibly inordinately political issue as well because for many they would argue this is the alliance sort of looking at itself and saying, we're actually incapable of doing what we said we would do to defend our populations, and we need to ratchet back our ambition, ratchet back our expectations of what the alliance can deliver. Um, how, do you, how do you navigate the shoals? I'm going to turn to uh, an ambassador who had to deal with the politics of this next, but let me ask you real quick, I mean, how do you deal with the criticism that this would be an admission of defeat for the alliance in some respect? Well, Frankly speaking, I think it was never very real, realistic that NATO should do six plus two operations almost at the same time. And um, I don't think many would, would be very disappointed if that level of ambition was changed a little bit. Because we are not going to do two plus six operations at the same time anyway. So it's not credible and it's undermining our credibility. That's my short answer. All right, thank you, Svein. Um, let me turn to your left. I'll come back to you, Jay, to wrap up with cyber, but let me turn to Ambassador uh, Stefanini, um, who, unlike Norway, which had to find its way, uh, information about Libya, um, Italy's, uh, as it projects into the Mediterranean, is intimately familiar with your neighbors to the south and the instability that the alliance is facing from that region. Um, from your perspective, Italy is a stalwart member of the alliance, a founding member of the alliance, um, but one that is also trying to balance the financial challenges uh, that we've been seeing uh, throughout the Eurozone, combined with the reality of instability to your south, um, something that's quite palpable, obviously, uh, for your country. Um, how does it sound uh, when you're hearing about uh, the concept that Barry has laid out hedging against Russia while still planning for greater ambition in the Middle East, preparing for the un unprepared, when you have to deal with the constraints of budgets and what your populations will support. Give us the perspective from the South. Um, thank you, Damon. And uh, it's, good to, it's good to be here. Uh, and it's good to be uh, next to uh, uh, Norway. I'm, I must say, surprisingly, uh, they might surprise some, uh, Norway is being one of the countries I worked the most closely in, in my time at NATO. Possibly because, you know, one from the north, one from the south, and uh, together we uh, sort of match the perspective of, say, uh, European NATO. Uh, before I get in, in, into answering to your question, let me just touch on something which was uh, I tried to focus for this panel, which is the relationship between uh, de deterrence and collective yes. defense. And then I'll come to, uh, to the Mediterranean, uh, which obviously is cl close to my heart. 
uh, you know, I was feeling a bit rusty, uh, you know, five, uh, five months after leaving uh, foreign service, uh, three years. I left NATO immediately after the strategic concept, and I'm completely affirmative. In December 2010, we had no clue, no idea that uh, there might be a Libya operation. To a point, then I was asked, because uh, as some might, may remember, Gaddafi just made a, a sort of most state, uh, state visit in Italy that August. And the, uh, the bilateral agreement with, with Libya could be somewhat, in, and it was, uh, at odds with uh, our NATO commitments. But when the question, which we asked ourselves at the time, could that be a problem? I mean, the answer was absolutely not. Why should ever NATO have any to do with Libya. And that was just eight months before the operation. So that shows that, that kind of unpredictability that uh, you, you outline. So I know, feeling a bit rusty, uh, I, had to, uh, I needed some help. Uh, I found some help in a, a, a young diplomat, a young and bright Italian diplomat sitting at my, uh, who actually took my seat uh, in, in the audience, Alessandro Cattani, who's uh, at the embassy. We have a very, uh, as you know, uh, Italy has a very natural eye. NATOized embassy here with uh, uh, the former uh, w Secretary General, who is actually uh, Ambassador Claudio, sitting in the first row. But uh, Alessandro's help wasn't enough, so uh, uh, I went a bit uh, further and, and you know, dealing with uh, new tools and new challenges. I, I thought a bit, bit of old wisdom was in order, and I found the best, what well, I think the best, <laughs> One of the best definitions of deterrence uh, in a uh, phrase uh, from uh, Machiavelli. Uh, there was a, an exhibition of Machiavelli just opened yesterday at the Italian Embassy. And Mr. And Master, I might just say, he walked in today and I said, I, I, enjoy, I appreciate the pen you have on your, your lapel. And indeed, it is a pen yes. of Machiavelli. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I of my figure in and, your remarks. Uh, Machiavelli says, fear preserves you by a dread of punishment which never fails. That's the essence of deterrence. And the problem we're coming up with against is that there are guys which there is no punishment. Uh, they, they don't fear a punishment. Either there are those two uh, subcategories, if you wish. Either, either because they, they think they will not be caught. That's the case possibly cyber defense. Or because uh, they. Uh, the punishment doesn't, you know, uh, the, the typical, the, the terrorist is not, uh, uh, is not being uh, punishable. So I think the issue is whether or not, I mean, the new challenges, there's a lot of literature about them. Uh, uh, new tools, there's a bit less so. And the issue is whether or not uh, deterrence is part of these uh, new tools. Uh, I think it is, uh, but it has to be a combination and that, that you imply when you talk about a portfolio, has to be a combination of uh, uh, measures, cannot be only military uh, deterrence, has to use uh, political, diplomatic, and uh, economic uh, means. Uh, and that calls on more, in my view, on more reliance on Article 4, more reliance on uh, partners, and uh, what I would call engagement, and obviously when, when I say engagement uh, is very much with uh, you know, Russia on my mind, rather than George. Um, the, um, the point about, uh, I, uh, and then very briefly I come to Russia, which you mentioned. Uh, I like very much the way you, uh, uh, Barry, you pointed out about the issue of hedging against Russia when you said that your main, cons your main concern is about a declining uh, uh, Russia, uh, which obviously is not going to be deterred purely by uh, a military hedge, but uh, with a sort of an array of means and uh, on one, one hand, a sort of credible, clear cut uh, military capability. On the other hand, a political uh, outreach uh, to Russia. Even if, at the present moment, the circumstances are not the most favorable. Of him. Um, the issue where, so my, uh, my take on uh, uh, the, the relationship between, uh, collect, between uh, deterrence and collective defense would be uh, we should deter when, uh, when we can, when we cannot deter, 
we have to think about collective defense. But the point is that uh, this defense has to be collective. Uh, NATO uh, has been defined by uh, values and by common goods, security being a common good, not by the threats or the challenges. What I mean is that whatever the challenge, whatever the challenges, the common good we want to protect is the same. Mm -hmm. So uh, in that respect, we have to be able to interpret, uh, and, uh, not even extensively, but to update the concept of armed attack. The point has been made uh, here about uh, uh, no, uh, uh, no military warfare being possibly way today, waged today without uh, a cyber dimension about, the, uh, about space. Uh, it's, it's a clear case for considering these dimensions as part of NATO responsibility. Uh, it may well be that some of them require uh, NATO to work with other organizations or, with, or in other fora, mm -hmm. energy being a case in point. But there, there has to be, they, they have to be present also uh, uh, in NATO. Uh, we, the, the bottom line about uh, uh, where we can deter and where we cannot deter is you mentioned about uh, West Westphalian plus uh, um, international uh, uh, environment is uh, two states, uh, even w if even the the most democratic one and the most di uh, the most authoritarian uh, uh, dictatorship to some extent share the same language. They don't share the same values, but they share the same objectives, you know, the preservation of uh, territorial integrity. This, when we talk about uh, terrorists or uh, pirates, for instance, there's the, the movie which is just out, Captain Phillips, the, you see the, the, uh, the captain and uh, the hijacker do not speak the same language. <coughs> they, they just uh, talk, and it's, the, the movie is very well done because there's a lot, sorry, not, not sympathy, but empathy for the, the, the makes you understand what makes those, uh, those pirates uh, tick. So when they, and we face this problem mainly when our interlocutor does not have a physical control of territory. And this, I come to, which is my point, uh, we uh, cannot deter um, asymmetrical threat, tra threats by definition. But we can address uh, at least some of the root causes. I know it's, a, say, uh, not always politically correct sense, uh, that create the asymmetrical threat. And without going uh, too much of that, say at least one which we'll call intermediate cause, which is uh, a failed state. Uh, to the extent we can prevent a failed state, we certainly limit the possibility of uh, uh, asymmetrical threats. Uh, we've said in, in Afghanistan, we see that in uh, Somalia. Uh, I'm afraid we, we, uh, <coughs> now the risk has moved very much to Northern Africa. Uh, while uh, uh, the US may or may not <laughs> have done its pivot to Asia, I think uh, Al-Qaeda and uh, Associates have done a pivot to Africa for a very simple reason, because the, uh, the Arab Springs or the Arab Awakening have created a situation uh, where there is a potential for uh, failed state or at least large part of land where there is no control by any uh, state authority. So here I come to uh, your question about uh, the Mediterranean demon. Uh, I certainly think uh, NATO has, uh, has to think about that as a possible uh, source of new threats. And uh, a threat which is not simply a threat to the, as is often said, to the southern flank of NATO is a threat that affects the entire Europe. I would say the, the entire 
Atl Atlantic area. Um, but there might be also some reason to think about because when we we cannot sort of dump all the greater Mid Middle East uh, in the same heap. Uh, the North, Northern Africa, the Maghreb, the Sahel, has some different dynamics. Uh, uh, and there, there, there could be some, uh, especially uh, in, uh, when we talk about Africa, some role for the EU uh, in, in association uh, with NATO. I think I hope this answers your question. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Um, I want to pick up on a couple of things that that uh, several of you said and come to, to Jay on this point. Um, I think uh, uh, the the way you teed it up, Ambassador, uh, the way I'll uh, punt it to Jay, um, is how do you apply Machiavelli to cyberspace? How do you how do you, how do you create the fear of punishment? Um, so as we turn to Jay. Uh, we've heard from Svein that it's inconceivable that the alliance could face a conflict where cyber would not be among the fronts. Um, we've heard uh, the concern about the fear uh, that they can be caught as being the essence of deterrence and how that applies here. And we've also heard, if you, for those NATO Knicks in the audience, um, the potential need to update thinking about what an armed attack means. If you read the Washington Treaty, Article 5, uh, which says an attack on one ally will be considered an attack on all, all allies, actually says an armed attack. So what does this mean? And uh, what does the what cyber domain mean in the concept of collective defense and deterrence for the alliance in the future? Great. Thank you, Damon. I also wanted to thank NATO. I mean, the organization itself, as well as everyone that's helped to make it strong. Um, yesterday was Veterans Day, Remembrance Day, and um, hopefully because of NATO, we never have to create another holiday like Remembrance Day to think of such a terrible war. And frankly, I think the, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize probably went to the wrong organization. Um, but thanks to NATO, and hopefully we can prevent that from ever happening again. So to pick up on cyber, and now everyone's supposed to say, ooh, cyber, ooh, cyber, because that's what you're supposed to do, right? Um, it's this new challenging area. Um, and I want to help put some of that to bed, I hope. Um, and show that a lot of NATO's traditional strengths, traditional areas that were strong and are going to serve us much better in cyber than we've really been led to believe. Um, so when we talk specifically about cyber deterrence, uh oh, I, I made General Cartwright's eyebrows go closer together. That means I might be in trouble later. Um, so when we when we talk about cyber deterrence, the main things that people are going to talk about and say, well, cyber deterrence is practically impossible because it's such an easy capability. Two kids in their basement can constitute a strategic capability. All you need are computers and, and the right brain, and how could we ever deter that? Or we'll never know who's responsible for it. You can't prove who did it and therefore you can't deter it. Or it happens at the speed of light and you can't warn it, so, so how could you ever deter it? And there are several more of these that we can go on that constitute, the, I think, the main pillar of thinking on cyber deterrence. But all of those are over here on the technical side. It's looking what happens at the level of tactical combat and extrapolating it to say that it's, that it's the whole of conflict. Um, and we don't have to do that. Um, it's like saying that what happens at, at the level of missile defense, you know, and how fast an engagement could go, um, or the level of aerial combat, um, that because a dogfight so, happens so quickly, that therefore you could never uh, deter an adversary from sending their bombers that could go nearly the speed of sound. Um, what happens at the tactical and technical levels within the domain, um, we've just said that therefore it's completely impossible. And that tends to be the strongest. Uh, as David mentioned, we just finished our um, first military history of cyber conflict um, called a fierce domain. Um, and what we saw that when we look at what are cyber problems, not just as this is, this is Fred telling me to stop pitching my book, and Fred Kemp is the last person to tell you to not pitch a book. Um, I think this may have been our own cyber attack here at the right? Atlantic Council, <laughs> right. as uh, some folks the, frown on your comments. And when we look at what's happened to cyber, not just as crime, not just as a collection of individual cyber attacks, but as actual conflict, 
And how else should NATO look at cyber other than actual conflict? We find that all of these technical things, it's speed of light, you never know who's responsible, it's so difficult to warn about. Two kids in a computer constitute a strategic capability. None of that, it's true at the technical level, but it's not true at the level of conflict. Because what we found when you look at it as conflict is that it overwhelmingly takes place within existing conflict or an ongoing conflict between existing national rivals. Which means that all of these technical truths fall away. Because you're generally going to know who's responsible. Because it's going to be the country that you're involved with an existing conflict about. Um, anyone that was confused about Estonia in 2007. People would say, oh, it's traces back to 178 different countries. We couldn't possibly tell who's responsible for this cyber assault on Estonia. They're looking at it over here at the technical level. If you want to see past that to the political truths behind that, it does not have to be difficult. NATO might make it difficult, but that's different from the dynamics of the underlying conflict. Likewise, the cyber attacks are easy to warn about, or they're more easy to warn about than when been told, because you don't have to stare down the wire looking for the evil ones and zeros. You can look at the overall dynamics of the conflict, the geopolitical realities, and the geopolitical realities are that cyber attacks, cyber conflicts, tend to follow physical conflicts and physical attacks. If you see a protest at the World Bank, you can expect there is going to be an online protest at the World Bank. If you see an ongoing conflict in the East China Sea or South China Sea, or a dust up, um, uh, say, over natural gas deliveries in, in Eastern and Central Europe um, from Russia, you can guess that there's going to start being a cyber conflict or a cyber component to that as well. You don't have to treat it as some new, dark, mystic thing um, that's different from cyber conflicts that have come before. So what we found, and this is incredibly important for NATO, is that the more strategically significant the conflict, the more similar it is to conflict in the air, land, and sea. So the more, I'll say that again, the more strategically significant the conflict, the more similar it is to conflict in the air, land, and sea. So one reason why deterrence seems so tough now, or why cyber seems so tough now, is that we're looking at these collection of individual incidents and racking our brains over how to deter these. When these are individual incidents that are probably not getting into NATO's typical lanes where we work with. I'll summarize that point when we get to the end. I would contend, to, to close out the main point, that cyber deterrence is obviously working. People that say that it's difficult or impossible are focusing on the technical or they're focusing on these day in, day out incidents. Maybe they're focusing on espionage. But for disruptive attacks, especially the most strategic cyber conflicts, I would contend the facts show, the history shows, here's where I hold up the book, the history shows, 9.99 on Amazon, um, the history shows that cyber deterrent is clearly working. Because we've been talking about a cyber Pearl Harbor since 1991. Over 20 years since, I'm sorry, over 20 of the years, um, we've been talking about a cyber Pearl Harbor for 20 of the 70 years since the actual Pearl Harbor. Clearly, there's a different dynamic going on. So what we see is that countries are willing to spy on one another. They're willing to have proxies that conduct conduct attacks on others. They're willing maybe to have low level cyber attacks on one, one another. But we haven't seen a big nation use real cyber, dis really destructive or disruptive cyber capabilities against another big nation. You haven't seen big nations use really disruptive cyber capabilities against a small nation outside of an existing conflict. You know, it's not out of the blue. It's taking place during uh, uh, existing tensions. So one of, one of my colleagues says, well, you can't call that deterrent. You have to call that restraint, that we're not willing to go above a certain threshold. <clears throat> Fine, call it restraint. 
But what you're seeing is nations are, ex are acting extremely similarly in this place to they do to others. They're not willing to do big disruptive attacks on one another because they fear getting caught, they fear getting punishment, they fear that this thin, that attribution might prove a very thin veil once people start to die. So I would say NATO going forward needs to look at three separate areas, and this gets to Barry's point of who and what are we trying to deter. First is we have today's issues, espionage, large levels of cyber crime, proxies by some countries. But that's not real cyber conflict the way that we've tended to think about it. Today's problems tend to be, host call it hostilities below the level of cyber conflict and how NATO is going to be getting involved in that area. And that I think can be tractable and I think NATO has been doing a good job at improving their own defenses and the rest. Second, you've got an area where we might someday really have a, a cyber conflict. Because um, that first year, what's happening today is never going to get us to an Article 5. Second, we might have an article, if we get ourselves into an Article 5 situation, it's not going to be from a bolt out of the blue cyber attack. I would strongly, uh, I, I would guess it would not. Um, it's not going to be some spooky way we get there. It's almost certainly going to be there through existing conflict with normal national power rivals that happens to escalate in some cyber fashion that you've got a massive impact to GDP, far larger than we've ever seen to date from a cyber attack, or we have dead bodies, which we've never had from a cyber attack that I can find. So it's going to look and feel like a normal Article 5, which radically, I think, simplifies NATO's plannings to get to this. And, and last, my, my closing point that my um, colleague and senior fellow Greg Ratchery makes a lot, when we talk about cyber deterrence, especially in the United States, we always tend to think that we're going to be the ones doing the deterring. And especially with our level of strategic vulnerability, I think within the United States and also NATO as a whole needs to look at how we might be getting deterred. How, can, how we can make sure that we won't be the one deterred from getting into a conflict. I mean, um, how we can stop others from deterring us. And that means how can we, it means in addition to other things, how we can make sure that NATO systems and our societies can survive the first strike from the adversary. Because this doesn't happen speed of light. Cyber conflicts tend to take place over weeks, months, or years. So what we want is to make sure that we can survive that first strike so that we can get into the place that we're good. We're democracies. We tend not to be good right out of the box. It takes us a while to warm up. So we need to avoid something like a six day of war where it was kind of lost in the first morning in the early airstrikes to make sure that we've got time to warm, to warm up. Um, and I think NATO has been doing pretty well by making sure, by focusing on defense of their own systems is a strong first goal there. Thank you, Damon. Thank you, Jay. Let me just pick up real quick before we bring in the audience. We've got time for discussion. And as I look across the audience, there's an inordinate depth of NATO expertise here. So I want to bring in the conversation uh, to hear from all of you. But here at the Atlantic Council, we actually went out and recruited Jay. We started the Cyber Statecraft Initiative precisely because we were hearing from many of our uh, allies and, and partners um, a concern about the disconnect between potentially how fast and how far where the United States was going and where its closest allies were, both in terms of doctrine and concepts, but in terms of capabilities. And that was sort of the purpose of actually standing up Cyber Statecraft Initiative here at the Atlantic Council, focusing on how to keep our like-minded partners in sync on where we're going. And that's what you've, you've been working a lot on. We're here having this conversation in the wake of yet another, yet another uh, round of headlines that keep sort of the issues in of the cyber domain with Snowden, the NSA leaks, as a source of, of, of tension, perhaps, in the transatlantic space. Um, how, how do we make sure that what we're doing, first of all, you talked about national versus NATO capabilities, and there's quite a distinction. Mm -hmm. How do you meet Stein's remit to incorporate cyber into defense planning, making this a source of real strength for the alliance unity of the alliance projecting outward rather than yet another source of, of, of tension and division that um, can be used by external actors to play divide and conquer, if you will. Yeah, the, there is, I think, a couple, uh, maybe three solid areas. One, I think, uh, within the DOD, just getting to accept 
um, that NATO has a strong role to play in this, and I think focusing on actual Article 5 and improving their own will, will help there. I've heard too many defense officials, even at um, too many US military cyber officials, even at NATO events, downplaying the role of NATO. Um, uh, one of our four-star generals, he wouldn't come out and said it was Russia that was responsible for Estonia. He wouldn't come out and say that um, uh, China was behind the espionage, even though the president would say that. So he was diplomatic about that, but he couldn't actually find anything nice to say about NATO and cyber. And, um, and that's, just, that's just putting us in a wrong direction. Second, I think we can deal with our classification schemes. Um, right now, our, uh, we so highly classify this in the United States, it completely limits our ability to have a debate even within our own country, um, and it especially makes it difficult for working with our allies. Um, Department of Defense has, um, you know, there are computer vulnerabilities that have to get patched. Uh, the DOD version of that is something called IAVIS. Um, they're unclassified, but for official use only, and we wouldn't even, share those FOUO with our NATO allies for a while. It took months and months to get this approved, and they're for official use only. And, um, and the comment that I heard was, well, what would they do? Why would we need to share this? Oh, you know, and it's just, it's just the wrong way of thinking about, thinking about, and I'm afraid that's only going to get worse now post Snowden, um, that we're going to continue to clamp down ever, ever further on that. Uh, third is um, we're coming out with some additional ideas on exactly what you said. I'll only focus on one, and it's, and it's really Frank Kramer's idea. Um, he said, you know, NATO's been in this place before, for example, looking at the nuclear planning group mm -hmm. um, of a capability, especially if you're looking at offensive capability that only a few uh, NATO um, uh, allies have, but it gives everyone a voice and uh, a stake in this discussion, and it's thinkable to have that on the offensive side um, that the allies that have offensive capability can come together um, and talk about how that might be used. If we, if we come up with another out of area operation, we're, it, we might need something like that so that we can talk about it, we can, we can think about how to bring these national capabilities um, best to bear. For sharing defensively, um, I think the things that the alliance has been up to, uh, increasing the capability of the NSERC, having the um, uh, Emerging Security Challenges Divisions, um, NATO, uh, I'm sorry, and uh, SAC, you're involved, are all going in the right direction. Terrific. Thank you, Jay. As we get into the conversation, we have the Ambassador of Estonia, we have General Cartwright, others that know a lot about cyber, so I welcome your comments on this. Let me remind the audience that uh, uh, we are welcoming and encouraging your tweeting today. Uh, for the whole, throughout the day, we're using the hashtag FutureNATO, hashtag FutureNATO, so feel free to tweet away, and on your agenda, you'll see the, uh, the handles of each of our speakers as well. Um, to kick off the conversation, I'm going to turn to Harlan Ullman, who caught my eye first, and part of this, I, wanna, I want to hear as we get take questions, field questions to the panel, is there almost a little bit of a Pollyannish uh, attitude up here? Are we not facing the reality of austerity? Can We've heard about the strategic level, we've heard about an actual work plan, but is this doable given where we are financially as well as politically? Harlan, please pick up the ball for us. And uh, if, if you could catch my eye, we'll get a microphone to you. And if I could ask, even if I know you for our television audience, if you could introduce yourself, say your name, and ask your question, please, Harlan. Um, I'm Harlan Ullman with the Atlantic Council. First, uh, many thanks <clears throat> uh, to the panel for a really excellent discussion. And I particularly associate myself with Svein's remarks. I think you're absolutely right. <clears throat> and maybe you should put your hat in the ring for a sec, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> My uh, question is really a provocation. Uh, I would assert that deterrence is a concept of the 20th century and really isn't relevant to the 21st. And I think the panel, by what they said or didn't say, may support that contention. Now the question is, what would take its place? And I would also observe that perhaps the two most important things that NATO can do and that can arise from the coming summit have not been mentioned. One, support TTIP, and two, develop some kind of argument to rally domestic support. Because the most crucial issue in my judgment is that we're lacking domestic support. I just came back from yet again another trip to NATO, and this is really missing in action. Um, so it seems to me to follow on what Sven said, and this is extremely difficult because NATO remains, whenever what we say about it, a military alliance, should the issue not be collective security and not collective defense? 
And if we can make that switch without too much language to go along with it, it seems to me that that would be ambiguous enough to bring into play all these other issues that have been, that are so important, but which individual members have some difficulty in dealing with. So should we not be looking at collective security rather than collective defense? Got it, thank you. I'm gonna pick up a couple of comments. I've seen a lot of hands. We've got some time to work through them all. Let me come up to the front here uh, with Lisa, Lisa Aronson, and then we'll come to these two here as well. Thanks. I'm Lisa Ahrens, and I'm uh, at the Council Visiting Fellow from RUSI London. Um, all the presentations mentioned the importance of credibility to deterrence, but nobody mentioned Afghanistan. Um, I'd like to just ask, I think this is understandable. I, Damon's mentioned several times we want this next summit to be the first one looking forward and not necessarily um, focused on Afghanistan. But I'd like to ask the panelists to reflect on how do we integrate efforts to answer big questions about Afghanistan, whether that's spending commitments, mechanisms for managing cash flow, sustainability of the ANSF, or status of forces agreement, integrating partners into the post-2014 Afghan mission. Um, these are all very sensitive issues, and it's important for F um, NATO's credibility, especially given the risks of ungoverned space in Afghanistan, or even possibly a terrorist attack being planned there from the, from the future. So how do we look forward for deterrence purposes, but also um, keep enough of attention on, on ISAF? Thanks. So I'm gonna make a pointed add to Lisa's question because she's being polite in some respects. If, if the best recipe for deterrence <laughs> is success and credibility, and the Afghan mission is not seen as that. It's seen perhaps as a failure by many of our publics. Isn't that at the heart of how getting that right? Isn't that at the heart of how you sustain deterrence going forward? Or, or how do you fix that conundrum? So that make a little point of that. And then the, we'll take two questions right here and then come back to the panel, please. This gentleman and lady, and yes, both of you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for such an educative uh, discussion. This is Dr. Nisar Chaudhry. I am with Pakistan American League. The world is going through uh, a constant transition from a unipolar world to a multipolar world. And uh, uh, my friend Barry Pell mentioned uh, about uh, Russia because of their system, the way they govern, and then virtually non-existence of true democracy and then because of technology, so much of oil and gas reserves are coming up, that they are going to go down, they can't bounce back. Uh, and then the Turkey's name was also mentioned, which is a member of uh, NATO. Uh, my question is that uh, NATO had been doing a lot of uh, firefighting in many areas of the world. Uh, does uh, NATO has the capacity to act unilaterally also without the leader, leadership of USA to prevent low intensity conflict or intercept the conflicts and resolve them. And Turkey is a member of the NATO. And uh, could I, somebody um, uh, educate me on this? What were the niches and glitches that he could not become the member of European Union <laughs> at the same time? Thank you. Thank you, sir. That last question is a topic of a whole nother conference that we've actually got running as well. But, <laughs> but let me, and just, just to his left, and we'll take this last question and come back to the panel. Thank you. My name is Dr. Lydia Kostopoulos, and I'm representing the Cybersecurity Forum Initiative. I oversee our mission in Europe, and I've dealt quite a bit with various nations there, more specifically in the Mediterranean. And as we deal with cyber issues, I've been engaging the communities there with cyber. And I have a question regarding austerity and our cyber allies and helping them out in the era of Snowden leaks. So what I found is many government officials, military officials, have said that they look up to the US and the way we do things. They respect our strategy and our efficiency and effectiveness. However, when it comes to cybersecurity now, many people are standing up their commands. And this is a sensitive national security issue. Seeing as our, some of our NATO allies are standing up their commands, how can we help them in a way that would not infringe on the sensitivity of standing up a cyber command considering the Snowden situation. Terrific, thank you for thank those you. questions. Let me come back and let me start with you, Barry. I wanna, uh, let's take the first two questions because I think Harlan asked a fundamental one. Is deterrence not a Cold War concept? Um, and how do we talk about 
NATO's future deterrence if we bury under the carpet uh, the issue of Afghanistan? Sure. Um, well, I, th I, don't think NATO, I don't think deterrence is an outdated concept. I wish it were, because the essence of deterrence is trying to uh, threaten harm on those who might think to do you harm in the international system. And unfortunately, the world has proven over the last, we can just take a couple of examples from the last couple of years, be they state actors or non-state actors, um, you know, Russia invaded Georgia, and we have terrorists still committing acts. I do think that in certain cases, terrorists can be deterred and have written about it uh, in an article with uh, non-resident senior fellow Matt Kronig, uh, that there are ways to deter terrorists if you really focus your efforts as well. And so I think, unfortunately, in the, the nature of the world is such that deterrence is still very central, but we, we've always had a lot of other activities going on next to and complementing and hopefully reinforcing deterrence, including security cooperation um, and various other forms of engagement. So I think you know deterrence by itself would be one hand clapping, but it's never been that case. I think it's a different form of deterrence. It's a much more tailored set of deterrence approaches that's required for a much more complex world. On the question of Afghanistan, I sort of have sort of two basic uh, answers, and I think it's a very important question. Number one, those who understand what's going on in Afghanistan better than I say it's going much better than the press, which tends to follow negative stories. I've heard more than positive stories would lead you to believe, but that doesn't change the perception question. Um, so on the broader question, I think you know, NATO's activities in Libya proved that it's rather adaptable. And so it's my sort of general answer to NATO and its credibility, et cetera, is it's the best we've got. I mean, it's adapted multiple times. As Damon has said, it's sort of entering its fifth chapter of major adaptation. And I think the, the, the key answers and the key questions at this conference is what will be the defining parameters of that fifth chapter of adaptation. So I think Afghanistan um, is probably, my short answer is it's probably going better than we're being led to believe, but even that said, there's a broad enough record of adaptation that I think um, credibility isn't quite at an issue, but we need to work at it because as, I've, as I said in my remarks, the challenges and the circumstances that NATO faces going forward over the next five to ten years are very different than the challenges that, the, that NATO is comfortable dealing with from its history. Thank you. Mr. Baster. Thank you. Uh, I'll just focus on Afghanistan, possibly because uh, my nearly four years at NATO was very much Afghanistan years, uh, and I've been doing a lot of thinking uh, what's uh, after uh, 2014. Obviously, there will be a lot of thinking about NATO after 2014 about Afghanistan. And the lesson learned, uh, we will know more, more about them after we've gone, gone out. and when we will be able to gauge what Afghanistan uh, will leave behind. I agree with Barry that we pro I go even, even further. We, NATO will leave, will leave in Afghanistan much better than uh, it found. Uh, Afghanistan, is being, uh, Afghanistan and Afghanistan are being given a chance which they didn't have before. Uh, there's another element which I think it's very, from the NATO point of view uh, that uh, Afghanistan proves a stamina in solidarity which may, we may not have suspected. Uh, so say that one more time, Stefano. Uh, was a stamina in solidarity. Mm -hmm. Who would have guessed that uh, uh, we, you know, after 10, 10 years, having all of us suffered uh, fairly high losses, not to mention the cost. You know, the, financial uh, cost, that we would still be there and we will actually, I mean, the in together, out together is a reality. And it's not, it's not happening, our periphery is, up, is happening in the, in the midst of the Hindu Kush. That proves a certain uh, political uh, uh, solidarity, political core of NATO, which is probably higher than we suspected, especially in 2003, 2004, when uh, uh, when, uh, when we got uh, into Afghanistan. Um, obviously, uh, uh, there are lessons uh, to be learned also in terms of, uh, exactly in terms of, uh, of deter deterrence. Deterrence has worked, uh, uh, I mean, take 
just imagine uh, in four years the Taliban are back in power in Kabul. Would they do the same they did before that hosting, giving a safe haven to Al Qaeda and risk again uh, uh, destruction? Probably not. Uh, in, in that respect, uh, what happened is a lesson uh, in, uh, in deterrence, where we've, we've not been able to, uh, uh, to be effective is in convincing the regional powers surrounding, I mean, Pakistan was mentioned before, right, that Afghanistan is not a zero-sum game. Mm -hmm. I just want to echo that one point. I ask you to repeat that because we are often up on the Hill briefing about the alliance and hear many concerns about the question that Harlan raised, political will, political support. And when you make the argument that we've been fighting a, a war in the middle of Asia for more than a decade with tens of thousands of European forces by our side, a scenario that we could little imagine, and at the height of the strain uh, uh, on the Alliance military forces exacerbated by one of the worst economic crises on the continent, the political will was still mustered to launch an operation in Libya, and we still have sustained our forces in Kosovo during this period. So there's a, uh, there, there are ways to look at this, and I think that was an important point you made, so I just wanted to draw that out. Um, it's fine, please pick up on a few of these, these elements, and then we'll come to Jay on cyber, and I'll come back to the audience. Yes, uh, um, to Holland, I would say that deterrence is a very old concept back from Machiavelli, as we heard. So it was not invented for the Cold War. But I agree, it, is, it has to be different. It has to be tailored to a new situation. And um, uh, when we talk to Russia, for example, um, deterrence and the military policy is accompanied, accompanied by a set of cooperative programs. So cooperation and military readiness doesn't exclude each other. So I think in, in total, this makes a policy which is sustainable and good. Fully agree with you that we need to work much more on rallying domestic support for NATO and defense in general. And um, the problem is that people don't really realize, I believe, what the risk of not doing that is. So we, we need to, we are working very actively in Norway on that and with good result, I would say. We have very good support. On Afghanistan, uh, I fully agree with, with the ambassador here. And um, uh, when we decided already in 2001, in the autumn, to send special forces to Afghanistan, uh, full support from all political parties, uh, I think the credibility of NATO as an organization and on the bilateral transatlantic relationship, it was not NATO who actually did the first operations there. Um, I think it, 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 proved, um, it proved quite effective. But, of course, um, the truth is also that there is a limitation as to what you can do with military forces. We have seen that in Afghanistan, even in Libya. And I think we, we, we have to be very clear. We can't just throw military forces at the problem. We need to, we need to, to think, um, to create a strategy where military component is only a part of it, a comprehensive approach, if you like. And I think that uh, we have done now a tremendous effort in Afghanistan for 12 years or so. Uh, 50 countries are engaged there now. Uh, I do not think that this will undermine NATO's credibility uh, as it is. But there is a limitation as to what you can do uh, with the military force in a place like Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Thank you, very important point. Jay, for Great. wrap up here. Uh, thank you. Uh, first to Harlan's point on the, um, uh, I like the, the, the collective defense because I keep trying to, to make the point, at least on cyber, we don't have to, to, to think about this as differently as we've been led to expect. Um, and that the, you know, because cyber conflicts are not that fundamentally different from other kinds of conflicts. So I would, I would like, to see as little change as possible, um, because I think we make it more confusing the more we try and think of it as different. Um, for, for CSFI, it's a, it's a great point, and, and I think the United States has certainly created the perception right now that um, we're, a, we're an exporter of insecurity in, into the internet rather than exporter of security, um, which is how we like to think of ourselves and, and, and how our policies are. I mean, I, I can imagine it would be very difficult if you are a, um, 
any other country and you were going to have American exporters, I mean, American experts come in to help you set up a cyber command or set up your cyber systems, uh, I think it would be reasonable for many countries to be doubtful about, about inviting us in. Hey, we're just going to bring in the NSA cyber experts to help, uh, to help configure these systems, um, which no a year ago might have made a lot of sense and nowadays would be, would be much more difficult. So I, I think this is going to hurt us in a lot of ways. There are at least three things that we can do. Uh, one is to continue to encourage regional groupings. I've heard a lot of great things that are happening among the Nordic countries um, uh, that have now set up. They can share classified information uh, between um, the, the cyber defenders in, e in, each of the, in each of the countries. Things like that, I think, will be very useful. We could see that in Visegrad countries and others. Um, second, I think there's much more that we could do on pooling and sharing. Um, I suspect that amongst the, the ally nations, we've got 28 separate contracts with Microsoft. We've got 28 separate um, uh, training houses to teach the same underlying standards and how to run Microsoft desktops and, and, and Cisco routers. Um, we're largely using the <laughs> same gear, the same standards, the same, um, uh, the same software. I suspect we could do a lot more pooling and sharing. For example, look at um, monitoring. Right now, I bet every country monitors their own military networks. You could find great ways to say, okay, what countries can we just share and we'll just have one monitoring center for, for several different countries. Um, yes, it could be difficult, but we've got uh, ally nations that are sharing navies, right? So this, this should be easier than that. Last, the real capability for defense in all of our countries, even the United States, is not the military, it's the private sector. Um, it's gonna be, they're the ones that are gonna be, they're gonna be winning or losing. Um, they're the ones that um, have the bulk of the capability to defend. Um, and a lot of the issues that we worry about, for example, sharing threat data, sharing vulnerability data, you don't have to spend two years to come up with an agreement with the United States on that. You can take your credit card and you can go to Symantec or McAfee or other of these countries and you can, just buy the, you can just buy the capability and it's pretty reasonable. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that we can do just by in increasing within the countries by just buying the capability that we need rather than trying to, trying to recreate it within the alliance or within national militaries. Thank you, Jay. Let me pick up another round of questions. Uh, let me start with uh, Ambassador Marina here in the front. And then I saw a hand in the back early on. Isabel will come over here as well, please. Thank you, Damon. First of all, I would like to, my name is Marina Galurand and I'm a student ambassador. First of all, I would like to thank all the panelists for your excellent remarks and very good discussion. And as an Estonian ambassador, perhaps I'm supposed to react on two words, cyber and Russia. So, so I'm not going to disappoint you, but only partly. I will re react on the word cyber. It was extremely good to hear that almost all panelists in one form or another mentioned cyber. And my comment is that, first of all, we have uh, cyber center of excellence that could be used in much better way than it is used today. It's good, it's efficient, but it could be used even better. And another thing is that at least my government is, uh, is proposing very concrete facilities for cyber exercises and cyber training that we also need to do in the context of NATO. And my question to the panelists is, taking into account that the next summit, 2014, will be 10 years after expansion of NATO, what we consider being a successful expansion, what should be the message in 2014 to those countries who are either waiting for MAP or full membership? What should be the message of NATO? Terrific. And let me pick up a, the question in the far back and then come up here to Isabel. Um, thank you, I'm Stanley Cobra. I'm looking at an article in today's Guardian of London. It's about um, young men from Turkey going to Syria to fight. Hundreds are thought to have been recruited by units affiliated to Al Qaeda. A father of one of these young men goes there to get his son back and he is confronted by one of these commanders. They are here to be martyred, he's told. They will be rewarded in paradise. 
A few days ago, maybe a couple of weeks ago now, um, the Turkish president, Mr. Gould, said, Afghanistan may be coming to the Mediterranean, referring to Syria. This is happening in Turkey, a NATO member. We have been discussing deterrence. How do you deter people who want to be martyred? Good question. Afghanistan to the Med. Let me come up here to Isabel Francois. Sorry, I think we have our mics running. See you about to. Thank you. Isabel Francois, Senior Fellow at the Atlantic Council's Co-Craft Center. My question uh, is perhaps more directed to Sven, and uh, it has to do with level of ambition. And I would agree that, uh, indeed, we need to look at this level of ambition uh, for credibility's sake, if nothing else. Uh, but my question to you is, uh, if you rain down, uh, if you lower uh, the level of ambition, how do you actually maintain uh, the effort and uh, the push that uh, has uh, been uh, our guidance for so long on capabilities? You know, would you expect uh, that nations will continue to uh, make that effort if NATO's level of ambition goes down? Thank you. Good question. And then let me pick you uh, right here in the aisle, please. So Isabel, you can pass it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Trina Flockhart. I'm from the Atlantic, uh, tra Transatlantic Academy. Sorry. I'm usually at the Danish Institute for International Studies. Uh, I would agree that uh, deterrence is not an outdated concept. But I think in NATO, there's a tendency to think about deterrence in outdated ways. Mm. And uh, perhaps the clearest example of that is the to put it bluntly, the retardation that NATO has to th think and speak sensibly about uh, deterrence and uh, defense outside the box. And I think that was especially clear during the deterrence and defense posture review that was closed so optitiously and, and brought to an end in the Chicago summit last year. So I suppose my question is, uh, and I completely agree with the point made by, by Frederick Kemper at the beginning, that as NATO moves towards this inflection point, it is utterly uh, imperative that NATO is able to think out of the box and to talk openly out of the box about how to approach deterrence in a new uh, security environment. But my question is, and there are so many people here who have direct input into NATO, how do we actually overcome those political obstacles to make NATO an organization that can talk about these issues in a sensible way that actually can lead to the change that is necessary. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. So I take it you were disappointed in the ambition of the defense and deterrence posture review. We might hear a little bit Very of that with so. uh, Ambassador Dalder, who's now arrived and joined us. So let me come back to the panel. We've got a, a medley of questions, if you will, that span <laughs> from open door to the use of the cyber center of excellence to the deterrence of, of an Afghanistan on the Mediterranean to the DDPR. Um, it's fine, maybe I start with you on this and if you want to pick up the free falling capabilities that Isabel asked about. Yes, uh, thank you. I'll, I'll try to answer that. Um, I think that the level of ambition needs to be changed, not necessarily reduced. But there are other ways of formulating it. Because if you maintain the guidance to have six plus two operations, you also uh, ask for tremendous uh, command and control apparatus. And sometimes I wonder whether we have too much focus on that and too, uh, too little focus on the actual forces to go into it. We have seven corps uh, commands in NATO, multinational corps commands, none of which are, are US, by the way. And of course, if you will go into a, a serious operation, we would certainly like the US to be, to be there at the top. That's just one example of, of what I'm alluding to. Uh, I think the, the, the planning needs to be totally changed in my view, because um, we have to take into account that there are national requirements too. We have national requirements. We cannot put all our resources to the NATO level uh, of ambition and NATO requirements. We need to focus NATO's force planning on what is the critical shortages and to create that. And what we see in practice is that a lot of countries are cutting big structures out of their forces without any consultation whatsoever. So this is not a process where you kind of optimize uh, contributions from all countries to fill that level of ambition. I'm not sure I answered your question. 
but I think we can formulate this in a better way without losing the, the need for countries to contribute. Terrific. Um, Stefano, let me turn to you. The, the, the issue in particular, you pick up on what you'd like, but in particular, how do you deter um, those that are going now to Syria to be martyred, this idea you end up having Afghanistan on the Mediterranean. How does this fit into the concepts of deterrence we've been talking about? Well, I, I think you know, we have to be honest with ourselves uh, in the sense that there are things we cannot do. Possibly, you, you, and we're not going to deter would-be martyrs. Uh, um, we, we, there are things that can be done at the on this specific point, you know, uh, young or middle-aged people who go uh, from Europe, from wherever, uh, to fight with Al Qaeda, uh, possibly more could be done in terms of homeland security. Um, you know, just an example. Um, I mean, th there is a track record of uh, British. Uh, you know, of Pakistani origin, but with British uh, passport and nationality going to Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, Pakistan requires visa for uh, non-citizens, even if, the, uh, if they were uh, originally, the, Pakistan does not recognize their nationality, so these are just British and they need a visa to travel to Pakistan. It, that can be monitor and possibly, uh, and there are ma many, many examples like that, but we enter in an area which is more homeland security than purely military. But that goes back to uh, the point which I made, and I certainly agree that uh, deterrence needs uh, to be updated. That's why I said it, it cannot be military only. It has to be, uh, uh, it does involve uh, intelligence, uh, economic, political, and, and homeland security all of the above. And since NATO cannot do everything, that will require NATO to work closely with nations and other organizations in such a way that each one does its own job, but there is coordination. I think in the US, you face domestically the same problem of uh, uh, interagency coordination in, secu in homeland security. So Barry, let me bring you in on this because I think, I think you and, and Matt perhaps did a piece, as you mentioned, on deterring individuals in these circumstances. So pick up on that as well as the concern from our Danish colleague about perhaps the lack of creativity in NATO's work on deterrence and defense posture within the alliance structures right now. Is it capable of taking this next step? Maybe I'll take the easier one first, which is deterring terrorists. Um, I think there's sort of two basic answers to that question. And uh, as I said, we wrote a piece in the Washington Quarterly deterring terrorists that can easily be um, looked up. And there was an, a chapter about this work um, when I was in the government in, the, in a book by Eric Schmidt and Tom Shanker called Counter-Strike, which gives you some of the more uh, you know, juicier backroom details. Um, but the essence of deterrence is to hold something at risk of the, that, that, that the person or that the organization or the leadership values. And you do that through two things. You threaten some sort of retaliation in response and you try to raise the costs or raise the defenses uh, a priori because no terrorist, no terrorist organization wants to suffer a failed um, attempt. So it'll either dissuade them from trying or it'll r raise the cost to a point that they're not willing to, um, uh, to try it. But even a martyr, and this is, this, this is obviously a level of difficulty that we're not as nuanced as a, as a government or as an alliance yet, but even a martyr values something. Some martyrs value how they die. You know, if they die in a bus or, you know, uh, with certain foodstuffs that are not considered uh, helpful for getting them to heaven, they're not going to do it. Um, so the Saudis used to go to the families of would-be terrorists and say, if you don't stop this activity that's being prepared, then we will, and we'll take it out on the family. Uh, so some terrorists value their families. And there's also different types of actors in a terrorist network. There are the foot soldiers and the martyrs, but there's also financiers, there's logistics, there's uh, command and control and others, and they're not, they all value different types of things and they're not all committed at the risk of their lives. And so another way to deter terrorist networks is to uh, you know, continue to press legal proceedings against sponsors, against state sponsors of, um, 
of terrorist activities as, as is still going on with the 9-11 with the 9-11 hijackers. Um, and so that's sort of the essence of the framework that was actually used in the Pentagon and the US government about, about seven, eight years ago to try to make some progress against, um, against Al Qaeda. And it is not only a military effort. It's a broad-based effort that requires various arms of uh, government. But on the question of Syria in particular, um, you know, we ultimately need to try to dry up the sources of, of disaffection and alienation that lead to extremism. And you have to look at the West's record of activity, or I should say non-activity regarding Syria. And we're actually creating more terrorists by the policy that we are choosing, which is basically let it burn uh, and try to stay away and try to stay disengaged. I'm being very frank here because I think it's an extremely serious problem. I was told by a senior intelligence official uh, within the last couple of months that Syria now is jihadi destination number one and that the flow of jihadis into Syria is much greater than the peak of jihadis going into Iraq. Uh, I believe that was in 2007. And so we are really creating more terrorists by our policy of relative disengagement in Syria that we're following. And it's a very, very important question that we should be attentive to. Thank you, Barry. Um, Jay, do you want to pick up uh, at all on the Center of Excellence's role? And yeah, without a doubt, I, mean, I think we can use CCD, CCD, COE better. It's, it, I think it's done some fantastic work, but it hasn't been fantastic work that I think the Alliance has really, re has really recognized or embraced. Um, so I'd be, I would be hopeful that in, in the ways forward and coming out of 2014, I think the members could, could fund some of the things that are more useful to, to the central debates that are going on. Um, the next CCD COE conference is going to be on active defense. It's a fascinating concept. I think there's a lot of things that can be interesting. NATO is years and years and years away from any, anything relating. So um, I, I think we can do, and it's really going to be up to members. And I think that we can tie this in mission question. Um, um, cause I'll tell you, I'm pretty happy with, um, with NATO on cyber and ecstatic about it cause opportunities to get it wrong, flashy and expensive ones, money down the drain, cut ribbons or, or is the much larger danger. Um, and that we're not going to make waste a lot of really limited ambition is that we, the cyber is a technological, primarily is a technological issue. You know, the, the techie about, and, and we should let that away from the warfare. Um, there's a do going in, uh, in summit. Um, so I am very happy with the status of the, the British and just saying, let's worry about our defense within fences and let's have we keep our focus on. I know some of the, some of the other would, would not be happy with that. There's a few other things that we could do. Five, um, the military staff are having to went into Article 5, what we do what once we're, right now it's difficult to what we would do because we're right now. It's difficult to see, um, this has been my, so imagine in a, we're, we're in a real cyber war. Thought experiment. We've got smoking, many, many, many people dead, willing um, to escalate weapons yet. What would NATO be doing in, forget things that we do now. We really know which country is responsible. Point. This is going to be difficult. So again, I think it's better to do a military, um, or, or th think through that and then see clarity goes. How conflict. Um, that, uh, I also think a focus on our, we, can, we do warning. That we do um, technical capability or focused on the ones and zeros. At the cyber aspects conflicts, that's to an Article 5 group. I think that's very achieved, even with modest levels of and sharing. Um, this level of ambition that will be, I'll be the first one to propose NATO monitor um, military mem for member nations to come together. Let me just, just put it right. And last, I think there's under a very modest level of ambition on rapid reaction teams. Cyber, the main answer is, well, if techie is to go to the country, show of uh, uh, this moment, there's a lot more. As someone that's had to run, I was the vice chairman of the financial service, this for the finance sector altogether, just needed a major to help tech know Sometimes technical capability or satellites need, and there's a lead beyond the of people that can help you with, there's a lot more RTs at a very Thank you, Jay. You challenge your level of ambition for this. One last round of comments. Matt Dorr, we aren't drilling down, um, looking towards next April. And we have to about just as partnership and thinking in the European integration story has to have a, a plays out as well. It's, let me pick up just a final round. Matt, Batum, try to keep them tight. We'll come back to the panel to wrap up. Uh, Matthew Kranig, a new non center at the Atlantic Council. For, uh, Jason Healy, you made the in fact that there hasn't been a major great power against another great power. Some uh, element of size strain. Uh, the classic problem of a deterrence, which is that if an attack adversary deterred or did he just conduct an attack in the first place? A little bit more about why you think it's and not just that uh, attack and, and then uh, right around the corner. So, mm -hmm. thank you. Too. 
Ambassador Cotelia. Uh, thank you, Kane Institute, and I would like to uh, thank you for asking question about the flow in terms of its enlargement. Uh, my question is on uh, aspect potential conflicts, and I fully share uh, the source, uh, uh, the one in the or conventional, it should be the uh, between, uh, let's say, uh, the size and the scope, geometry um, uh, of the response, of the uh, responding to them, uh, those who are not vulnerable to a cyber attack, they are more. Vulnerable. So, uh, uh, are potentials of the asymmetry? of this response. Thank you. Thank you. Let me take the last two questions right here, and if you could be brief, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joseph Wolfsheimer. Uh, for 25 years, I worked in NATO and SHAPE, uh, first at the SHAPE Technical Center, working on mm -hmm. command and control and SATCOM systems, and then I was at uh, SHAPE helping with nuclear planning and with helping support the nuclear planning group staff group and the HLG, which uh, some of you are familiar with. Uh, I noted that my, f since I had both feet, both feet, I had had one foot in the uh, computer world and one foot in the consultation world, that uh, in terms of the nuclear planning group, uh, that group over time with the consultation uh, mechanisms that they set up created a mechanism for diplomats to understand military planning uh, considerations and for the military planners to understand diplomatic uh, considerations. Uh, I see 
with the two groups that I work with, computer folks and uh, diplomats, that there is a sort of uh, a gorge between the two that's not been filled. Uh, the technicians don't understand the uh, consultation uh, considerations, and the uh, diplomats don't always understand the other side. Uh, last year, I think in CMX, NATO had a little bit of a cyber play. How can we look, work <laughs> this going forward so that we get to the same level of co-understanding that we have in the military world? Thank you. Sorry Thank to have been you. so long. No, my final question, please. Thanks, Damon. Steve Shapiro, a um, Atlanta Council member. I want to just push back a little on uh, Jason's comment that it's uh, the techies on one side and the war fighting on the other side and use that to get to Barry's point, which I think is probably, from my perspective, the major point of the, of the day or of the panel. Uh, in a meeting I had in uh, the end of 11 with the Latvian presidential cyber team, uh, it was disclosed to, uh, to, to, my, to my group that uh, uh, the, the, the major cyber problem Latvia faced at that moment was not war fighting problems, but in fact that most every operating system by, owned by civilians throughout the country was purchased on the black market. And the black market, of course, was produced in the east. And as a result, it was estimated in December of 11 that 80% of personal computers in Latvia were infected with botnets controlled by some mysterious third party. So um, the idea that the techies and the war fighting are totally separate in this regard, uh, I think need to be, to be blended um, because, of course, Latvia viewed that as a major national security threat, including, by the way, one of the presidential team's own <laughs> PCs. He bought his system on the black market, uh, and which leads, uh, and it was an expense issue when shortly after our visit, word got back to Microsoft and suddenly Windows price dropped. So that was an interesting thing. And then that, I think, implicates the whole concept of out of the box thinking, what is defense, what is an attack, and Barry's comments about uh, about attacks or threats to security, including everything from from uh, political funding to real estate attacks to uh, demographic attacks, et cetera. I think I, I sadly didn't hear the Europeans pick up on those as uh, their versions of, of uh, threats to security. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. With that onslaught, let me start with you. And if others would like to comment on that, we will. And we'll use this to ramp up this session as the the clock is running. Yeah, Matt, great, great question. Um, I'm just trying to get us to ask the right question, because a lot of times we just jump to this theoretical or technical facts of saying deterrence is this, that, or the other. I want us to zoom in and explain this question. If countries have had capabilities to affect one another for over 20 years, and we've been vulnerable for at least 20 years, what explains this fact? So let's start this from our traditional international relations, traditional national security theories, to take this fact. Because I'm so tired of hearing people say, oh, this is all anonymous. You can never trace it back. Deterrence is impossible, um, which, is, which is ivory tower theory combined with technical looking at the ones and zeros. So I want to I start from that, from that point. Uh, to me, it's clear. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for someone to explain this vulnerability and capability and, and take it from that part. Um, two on the asymmetry, um, it's, it's a great question. And, and I think because we make it, a lot of the cyber people are trying to, those of us that do cyber defense, a lot of us want to just terrorize our political leadership about how bad things are today. Things are so bad right now, you have to be really, really, really scared that we've really confused a lot of the issue about how bad things could actually become in future. Um, so again, that's why I want to separate these things that could be clearly Article 5, and let's treat those separately, and then the issues that have really been bothering us day to day and, and have gotten us to this point. So for example, for Estonia, I, you know, to me, it, we, we were well away from Article 5 on that. If I'd been at the White House during that point, I would have told the president, ignore all of the other countries. Some of the attacks are coming from the US. We've got to stop those. But Russia's the country really responsible here. Let's pick up the phone. Let's call Mr. Putin. Tell him that here's, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going we're gonna to tell Cyber Command to start military, or JFCCNW to start military planning um, for counter strikes. We're going to ask the NATO SecGen to, to, to start making similar calls. 
Um, we'll start additional, there's all sorts of stuff that you can do that are below the level of Article 5 that can start putting on military diplomatic pol political pressure um, that stays within these asymmetries. Um, you know, canceling visas. I mean, we've got so many other elements of state power that we could use um, if we can just get ourselves out of this, th this technical bit. Um, the, I think that cyber exercises help encourage, or at least when I was in the military, help encourage this view of worrying about the, the technical bit. Um, so many exercises seem, that I've been part of seem to get us into this, you can't tell who it is, um, and it's happening speed of light uh, aspect that make it more difficult, that I think we tend to always jump to the most difficult scenarios. Um, I would love that we exercise simple scenarios. We know who it is, it's part of it, we, we, we've got warning about this, and we start solving the simple issues, and then start solving the most difficult issues and using the exercises for that. Um, and last, when we, a couple years ago, I had to ask to, um, to write about non-states role in, in cyber conflict. And when we talk about non-states, we almost all tend to say, yes, isn't it terrible how much capability that they have to do harm? Um, you know, getting, getting to our, our work with Global Trends 2030, superpower in individuals, diffusion of power. Um, yes, it's terrible how these, this, these non-states can do bad, bad things. But that jumps on the worst part of it. The non-states can also be there for the defense. They can also be there to help solve the problems. Um, and frankly, they're the ones, the agility, the flexibility, they have their hands deep in cyberspace to help fix those problems. So a lot of our solutions are gonna be relying on the private sector. That's gonna be difficult for governments to do. Phew. Terrific. I love the way that round of questions took Jay from advocating the status quo to escalation. <laughs> <laughs> um, a quick comment to, to yes, close. Uh, I'll fine. just say that when we played in a, in a crisis management exercise in NATO with the cyber, we had the problem that we didn't really have a, a catalog of options hmm. that we could present to the politi politicians because the politicians need also to be explained what are the implications of the different courses of action. Now we have done that, and that at least gives us a tool to work with when and if a crisis arises. Thank you. Mm. Terrific. Let me right. take that, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up, I think, right there just with the interest of time. Um, Svein just captured the essence of what we're trying to do today. How do you adapt concepts of deterrence to the new reality, this historic inflection point that we began the conversation with today? Um, and in many respects, as we've heard, NATO is premised on deterrence, it's premised on uh, protection of its members, collective defense. Uh, but just as recent history has taught the alliance to defend itself, to deter that it actually means it has to operate far from, uh, from Europe in many cases, I think part of what we're trying to get at today and what we started, I think, very effectively on this, this panel is exploring how these new global shifts, these new actors, these new tools, disruptive technology, how the alliance adapts both its, its concepts but its tools uh, to ensure its deterrence and collective defense going forward. So please join me in, in thanking uh, this terrific group of panelists for an insightful conversation. Thank you.